testing, one, two, three. This is the new voice of your conscience. <laughs> Okay, welcome folks. My name is Nathaniel. It will be my pleasure to be your guide here at Nazareth Village. We'll take a regular tour of about an hour and a quarter, unless there's a reason otherwise. Sounds tour good. leader, that's all right? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, Victoria, Victoria is joining us just to listen in. She's one of our guides. Uh, just doing a bit of a refresher. Uh, and so, um, Nazareth Village, we have built here as in the photos, a replica of a first century village. We are extremely careful to follow the archaeology. So we've used only the building styles and the materials that they were using back then. Also, where we came to build a mini village, we found the remains of an ancient farm. And we restored the farm, and we planted here plants and trees that you know very well from the pages of the Bible. We know the Bible, right? Yes. Awesome. So. <laughs> Uh, we're going to point them out. If, ne if you've never seen them, you're going to see some of them, okay? Uh, and we're also going to see people dressed in first century costume, walking around, doing everyday life, out in the farm and in their home, sweating bullets for your sakes, okay? <laughs> uh, and uh, we're going to see what life was like back then, okay? Uh, you are welcome to take as many photos or video as you like, as long as it is for your personal, non-commercial use. You've got any other plans? Stop at our office, fill the form, and we'll talk about it, okay? Um, good. The last point here is that the whole tour is not on a flat, beautiful floor like this. It's out on a gravelly trail. There's lots of uneven spots. There's lots of little steps. Please be very careful as we go. If you are at all unsteady on your feet, buddy up with a partner. If you didn't make a partner or bring one with you, now's the time to begin, okay? Because we... We, we're allowed to have fun, we're allowed to ask questions, but hurting yourself is simply yeah. forbidden, okay? <laughs> please follow me out, and the last person, please close the wood door. Rosemary bushes. What is this? A fall bloom? Okay, I guess they're <laughs> fall blooming. Usually it's the spring, but there's a bit of fall bloom here. And the lovely ladies, speaking of flowers. <laughs> lovely group, lovely ladies, lovely ladies, lovely group. Here we go. I'm not going to. Hi, right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Come on over, friends, once you've taken a photo of the lovely ladies. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. They, 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 they can be a slow. I see. <laughs> Where are you Safety from, first. Ben? Ah, uh, I'll repeat. I, uh, that weird accent is... Israeli and Canadian, I'm half and half, half and halfer, 
Uh, so I might sound Michiganian to you, uh, but it's uh, we're you know we're going out in a boat. You know what I'm saying? Hey. 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 Yeah, exactly. Okay, please give your attention to Simon over here. Hi, everybody. Morning. Morning, Morning. Morning Simon. Please come here to see everything. Keep going. Keep going. Please here. That's everybody, Simon. Well, as Mr. Uh, Nathaniel said, I'm Simon, the farmer of the village, at least 2,000 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and mid of October, we start harvesting the olive. Now, we're going to wait for the first rain. Usually, in mid of October, when it rain, then we start picking. Why we wait for the rain? Because we, not the, uh, we want the tree to be clean from dust and also the fruits clean from dust. First of all, we put blanket down on the tree. There's two ways to pick olives. The first way, with the hands, fingers. I mean, we catch this branch, for example, and we start putting all the, the fruit down, like that, like that, on the blanket. When we finish the whole tree, then we collect all the olives, send it to the press, or send it to the kitchen for picking. Now then, the second one is with stick. I mean, all the high branches that we can reach it. Then we start hit it with a stick. And this is not a good way because we broke a lot of branches. Then for the next year, it won't have any more olives. In the same time, we pick in olives, also we prune the tree. That means we don't want any high branches to be. We take it from down, we take all of it. Look, for example, this tree, many of high branches. And when we start picking olives, I will take all of it down. I'll leave just the circle, the places that we can reach. There's many good things to uh, cut branches. First of all, we want the sun and the light to come on through the whole area, the whole places that we want to be grown, that we want olives, the low places. Also, less branches, less branches, big fruits, big olives joicy olives, full of oil. Also for our safety, we don't want to climb on the tree, then we slip, putting down, breaking hand or breaking leg, and so it's very dangerous. And in the same time also, we pick in olives. We usually uh, choose the big green olives, crushed like that, put it on salt and water and lemon, and then after one or two weeks, we eat it. It's very, very delicious. Also giving you a lot of appetite to eat. All right. Any question? Thank you, Simon. Let's give him a round of applause for that. Thank Hello. you so much. Enjoy your time. Good. Please follow me as we continue down the path and watch your step. Watch your step. Olive trees are really tough, resilient trees. They can withstand fire even and grow again. Uh, even in years when it doesn't rain very much, they still at least give us a little bit of fruit. Okay, And so they've become a symbol uh, of hope. They're also really long livers, so they become a symbol of long life as well. Okay, They're one of the trees you can dig around them, take part of the roots, cut off the rest and transplant to a new place. In fact, many of the trees you see have been moved here successfully like this. Let's go visit our oldest olive tree. It's just over here. Lump here with the tree. This over here is our oldest olive tree. It's more than 400 years old. But they can grow relatively easily into the above 1,000 years. I want to draw your attention to the shoots right here that are grown up since the spring. 
Uh, you give them four or five years, you get to this uh, one over here on the right that for the second year running is bearing fruit. That's incredible growth and maturity because they are not growing from the seeds. You can grow from the seeds, but it's much, much slower. These are growing quickly because they're drawing energy. They're connected to the roots of this tree under the ground. The new shoot or sucker in Hebrew uh, is the word netzer. Everyone please say netzer. netzer. Beautiful. Netzer is where we believe the word for Nazareth comes from. Netzer in Hebrew, Nazareth in English. These are really important, they're the babies of the tree. If you dig down to the root where they're growing, cut off a piece of the wood, transplant water correctly, you get a much faster growth of a new olive tree. And they appear in Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 1, says a new shoot, a new netzer, will grow up from the roots of Jesse. This Jesse is the father of? David, David the king, who's the forefather of? Jesus. Jesus. Remember the beginning of Matthew. So Matthew later on in his gospel says, it fulfills the words of the prophets. He, Jesus, will be called the Nazarene. From Nazareth, from, we believe, this word, new shoot. Netzer. Good? Yes. Clear? Great. As we keep going past the oldest olive tree, we start having another type of biblical tree. These are almonds, and you can see the pods. Uh, they're pretty much ready right now in the next few weeks for harvest. Okay, almond appears in the beginning of the book of Jeremiah. And also, remember the staff of Aaron, the blooms almond flower and fruit to show God had chosen him and the tribe of Levi. All right, so still olives on the left, almonds on the right. Watch your step and let's keep going. We got a few uh, leftovers of our summer vegetables here in the field. This is actually our main field of wheat, but it's the wrong time of year for wheat, so we're not going to get into that. I wanted to introduce you to one of our female donkeys, Habib Kihai. Uh, donkey, of course, is an extremely biblical animal. It's relatively affordable, uh, and so most people can afford to own a donkey. Okay. Uh, it's not such a picky eater, so you can feed it a lot of your uh, vegetable food leavings and it eats lots of plants. Uh, this is uh, the main beast of burden for most people. Uh, and so it's kind of like a Toyota Corolla or a Ford Focus. Okay, A horse uh, is a much bigger, more expensive animal. It's even a pickier eater. And so it's more like having a Mercedes uh, or a Cadillac. Okay. Uh, so, let's say goodbye to Habibti and meet another uh, friend of the Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you got. You have a sticker on the front of your shirt. <laughs> Beta wasn't going to tell you about it. Okay. Uh, very few pick 
scriptures are biblical as the shepherd and the sheep. Uh, you may have noticed that we've sheared the sheep. This is done in the earlier part of the summer before it gets too hot. It doesn't hurt the sheep. We get the wool. They get to be cool. Everybody wins. <laughs> okay? Um, we actually make, turn wool into clothing. We're going to see this later in our weaver's workshop. Uh, you can all often have mixed flock of sheep and of goats, right? Um, they're a similar size animal. They have pretty much the same needs. Um, but psychologically and behaviorally, they, add, they, they behave very differently. Sheep are relatively obedient, relatively docile. And so as they get to know their shepherd over time, they begin to recognize his voice and even his smell. So when he opens the door, they follow him out relatively obedient and docile. Uh, when you open the door for goats, they go ping, ping, ping. <laughs> they don't listen. They're extremely st much more stubborn animal. They uh, are very uh, though dexterous, and they'll put their hoofs up on the tree and start eating the olives and the and the leaves. Uh, you can't stop them. Uh, yeah. So that's why Jesus does not say, "My goats hear my voice." <laughs> they wouldn't listen. Also, this is why Jesus talks about the separating of the sheep and the goats in the end of time. The sheep to the right to receive reward for following and listening and doing the work of their good shepherd, and the goats to the left to receive punishment because they were too busy following themselves. Um, now, uh, goat hair can be used when you go to shear the sheep and shear the goats, you separate them. That's when you would do the separation and shearing them. Uh, and the sheep, as we said, clothing. The goat hair is used for tent material. For example, the tabernacle in the wilderness, the second of four covers, the tent material is made from goat hair. The Bedouins still to this day make their tent material from the goat hair, from the goats that they're raising. Okay? Uh, of course, these are kosher animals, uh, so they can be sacrificed to God. Their meat is uh, edible for, I mean, everything's edible, but they're allowed to be eaten right, by the people of Israel. Then also they give milk, and you can make cheese and butter, etc., etc. So they're very, very important. Uh, so no, not surprisingly, they appear all over scriptures, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had many sheep. We got Moses and David, who were shepherds before they became leaders. David turns around and says, the Lord is my shepherd. And Jesus shows up and uses the same imagery in John chapter 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd even gives his life for the sheep. He says, I'm the door to the sheepfold. Whoever comes in through me will be saved. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. They hear my voice, and they follow after me. <laughs> Thank you, Abraham. Thank you. Thank you. there's a burial cave we cut into the rock and the walls we've cut holes or niches which is where the bodies would be laid and then the round stone door the track that it moves unclosed and then when you need to to uh to not receive a proper burial was considered a kind of tragedy maybe even a sign of god's displeasure on the person who died uh, so uh, of course burials were important to them um, because of the weather and also because of certain parts of scripture, they bury very, very quickly, usually within 24 hours. Even today, the Jewish community will do within a day the burial, unless there's extenuating circumstances. Okay? Um, they, of course, begin mourning and preparing the body for burial, uh, usually washing the body. The poor simply wrap the body in linen, uh, sorry, in, a, in just a sheet, and bury it into a hole in the ground and cover it up. The rich, who can afford this kind of burial, right, buying the land, cutting the rock, etc., also use more expensive stuff. So the linen, I, I misspoke, right? Poor people probably can't afford linen, most of them, but the rich can, to wrap the body in linen cloth and using expensive fragrant spices like myrrh and aloes to wrap in with the cloth, put the body inside, close the door. In the New Testament, notice when it tells us that Jesus is being buried, 
this is exactly how it describes the burial. Okay? Bear in mind that this stone is an average size. Even at this size, it's at least half a ton, if not towards a ton. It's very hard to move, okay? Not such a simple thing. If it gets much bigger, you're going to have trouble. And um, Jesus is buried like a rich man by a rich man, right? Remember, Joseph of Arimathea tells us specifically he's a rich man. Bear in mind, though, Jesus is poor, okay? We actually have a whole bunch of verses in the New Testament that tell us Jesus is poor. Uh, one small example. Remember then they're asking Jesus about paying taxes to Caesar. So Jesus pulls out his wallet and pulls out a coin to answer, right? No, he doesn't. He doesn't have a... We don't... They didn't have wallets back then. They had money purses, okay? He didn't have a money purse. He has to ask the audience for the coin, okay? Just one of the many examples. Remember Judas had the money bag. They had a common purse. And he was already on a crooked path. It tells us in one of the Gospels that he was sneaking money out of the money bag to pay for stuff that he wanted. Hmm. There was already trouble um, with Judas. Anyway, back to our story. Right? So Jesus doesn't even have a day's wages to answer the question. He has to borrow the coin from the crowd, and then you know the answer that he gives. So, just one example of Jesus living a poor man's life. This is important because Isaiah foretold this hundreds of years before. It says uh, in Isaiah 53 verse 9 that he will be with the rich in his death. And so it is fulfilled. Questions? Good. Let's continue. I, I got you on camera. <laughs> you gonna feel for real funny when I give it to the guards at the airport and you're stuck in Israel. <laughs> Mr. Tiny Sir, Tiny Israeli man, will you look at my footage? <laughs> he assaulted me. <laughs> school, there's an international volunteer program, and Nazareth Village. So there's four parts under the bigger umbrella. Incidentally, if you're interested in coming back and volunteering, getting in costume, helping us, sweating bullets with the rest of the crew, you're most welcome. Stop at the office for more information. So our foundation bought this land more than a hundred years ago, back when Nazareth was just a little village. As you can imagine, the last 50, 60 years, the city has spread, and you can see it's all around our property now. But this is how this land was saved from these kinds of ugly monstrosities, I mean modern buildings, Amen, uh, so that we could find a vineyard on this hillside that you're looking at when we came to do a dig in the mid to late 90s. Okay, See the stone walls facing you? Okay, There, the wedge wall... Uh, uh, a stable structure stabilizes the soil that's filled in behind them, a strip of field, or an agricultural terrace or step on the side of the hill. That's how you do farming. Many of these were here. They were broken down, covered up with earth. We dug them up in an archaeological div, examined how they were built, and restored them meticulously. They were here. Also, we revealed this place on the rock. Right here, I have a flat-ish, square-ish area. This is not natural. It was cut with iron tools by human hands. This is a wine press. Wine press plus terraces says vineyard. So we grow grapes now up there like they were 2,000 years ago. July and August were just past the harvest. Uh, they would gather the grapes together. If they had excess that they couldn't eat, they would turn it into wine. They put the grapes down here, take off their sandals, wash their feet, and walk on the grapes barefoot. 
anybody know why they do this work barefoot? Except people who've been here before. What's inside of the grapes, folks? Seeds. Yeah, if you crush the seeds, ever eaten through seeded grapes? Yeah. It makes a bitter flavor, and you do that enough, it'll ruin the taste of the wine in the end. Turns out that the barefoot is perfect to get out the juice, but it's just soft enough not to break the seeds. Isn't that nice of God to make the human body the perfect tool? The juice and everything flows down the channel right here that they dug in the rock, all original again, and into the big vat here below. Drops about four or five feet. Okay. Uh, this is the vat where the juice collects. As you work, the juice level rises. You come with jars and new wineskins, fill them up with the juice and take them home. The juice ferments over the next few weeks and becomes new wine. Now, grapes and wine and vineyards. This is incredibly biblical stuff. So not surprisingly, this also appears in the parables of Jesus. For example, Jesus says a man planted a vineyard and he built a wall around it. He dug a wine press and he built a watchtower. So we have all the parts of Jesus' parable vineyard right here. And the village is about half a mile in that direction, which is where the Church of the Annunciation is. Most people accept that that is roughly correct where the village was in the time of Jesus. So it's maybe a five, ten minute walk to come from the village to this vineyard. So we think it's very likely Jesus knew this place personally. Feel free then to come on up, take a closer look at this, take a photo or a video. This wine press is 2,000 years old. We know that from the pieces of pottery we found in the archaeological dig, the dating. Okay, so please be careful if you climb onto the rock, hurting yourself. <laughs> Is somebody telling on you? This didn't happen. Okay. You can't tell people this. 
because we're done the harvest. But anyone who wants to taste nice, sweet red grapes. Okay. I can get a picture. You went too fast. Yeah. Oh, you can get a picture. No, I gotta have a picture. So. Okay, one more time. <laughs> it didn't happen. Pomegranate. You, you no can't put it on the internet. Okay. We have no you pictures. You cannot put this photo on the internet. It's just for your own edification. Okay. okay. Take some, pass it down. Okay, you're just gonna have to ignore. It's not perfect. Okay, don't eat the ones that have been opened by the insects. Insects are very clean. Okay, wow. you're not gonna get sick from insect uh, oh eating. Oh my gosh, that is as good okay. as I've ever had. Oh, yeah. yeah. So oh, actually, it stays on longer and it gets sweeter, right? Because we're on the way to it becoming um, uh, raisin, so, sort of, right? Plus, these have hung a long time and they get to be, yeah, let's keep passing down. Okay, a little bit, unless you really don't want, they are seeded, I warn you. So. Uh, if you've never eaten seeded grapes, now's your chance to taste a teeny bit of that bitter flavor when you chew through that seed. You'll notice it's not Forced sweet it like out. the rest of the grape. <laughs> when you chew it, so it gets, you get to experiment. I repeat, you cannot tell anybody we did this. You can't put any photos of the grapes on the internet, except the, the, the photos of them hanging on the, not me holding, yeah? Okay, good. Incidentally, another thing that can't hurt you, see the white, it's not just dust. It turns out actually there's yeast on here. Right? It won't hurt you, you've got bacteria in your innards and stuff. You'll be fine. Apples, okay? pomegranates. That's why you crush them. It's not goat cheese. It's the yeast off of the, the skins of the grapes. I told you they wash their feet. Right? Is the yeast from here gets in there, turns out, and is eating the sugar and making it into alcohol and carbon dioxide, and that's why it's bubbly uppy and becomes something you can get drunk on. Okay. Resisting taking that pomegranate and grinding it, it up. It's pretty tough. Not to grab it. I mean, they've got trees full of them. They ain't gonna miss one. Did they say anything? He's, he gave me grapes. Okay. Yeah, huh? Mm. Exactly. See, by the way, in North America, I don't know if you realize this, they throw tons, millions of tons of fruit away in the supermarkets. When the bananas turn spotty is when they're sweetest, you know. Right? When things start having, certain types of fruit are not ripe inside until they start having actually some growth on them. For example, papaya. It might look kind of ugly on the outside, is when it's sweet on the inside, mm -hmm. usually. Okay, but we're not used to tropical fruits, so we don't know that. Anyway, that was a little bonus. All right. Right, don't judge a book by its cover. Okay, let's talk about the parable of the sower here. Okay, the one thing we are going to have to imagine that instead of thousands and thousands of visitors packing down this ground, that this earth is being plowed open with a plow. So it's open, so it's ready to receive the seed that the sower is going to take out of the bag and sprinkle into the ground. Okay? He comes right to the edge of the field, close to the path or the way. He's taking a strategic risk. He wants to use up this land beside the path. A little bit of the seed falls on the path. He's not purposefully throwing away perfectly good seed. Where it falls on the path, the birds come and eat it, and it's yummy in their tummy. The second soil is bedrocky soil. We got excellent examples of this all around us, here and here, okay? Pretty much bedrock is everywhere around here in this kind of environment, okay? The question is how much soil is on top of the bedrock. When it's too shallow, okay, um, then 
uh, it's a problem because you'll sow seed, the rain will come, everything will grow, and you think everything's fine. But then the hot spring sun follows and it dries up and kills all these plants because they only have had shallow roots with the bedrock underneath. The third soil is weedy or thorny soil. Even if you plowed the ground, um, you can still have the roots of the weeds in there and the wind of course can bring new seeds of weeds and when it rains the bad stuff grows faster than the good stuff of course and it oh, chokes the life of the wheat too much competition means no good fruit at the end and then the good soil which produces a plentiful harvest 30 times 60 times 100 times the seed compared to how much the farmer threw into the ground in the beginning let all who have ears to hear hear Remember also we have the parable of the master of the banquet. He prepares this delicious banquet, invites all his neighbors and stuff. Then he sends the servants say, okay, the banquet is ready, come on. And they start coming up with excuses. Well, one of the excuses, if you'll recall, is, oh, I just bought a field and I had to go see it. Uh, just a second. You buy anything before you're going to see it? And even if he did see it, why does he have to go see it again now? Right? It's clearly a lame excuse, okay? Also bear in mind, right, the value of the field is based on you looking good at it, okay? Let's say it's a terrace field, but even in a flat space, those are half big stones you gotta remove so that the, the plow can't go through, okay? Um, with terrace structures, is the wall properly built or is it starting to fall apart and you have to rebuild it so that you have the flat space? So all kinds of factors here that will affect the price of the field. It's ridiculous, okay? No wonder the master of the banquet gets really peeved and he says, these people are not gonna eat a stitch of the wonderful feast that I have prepared. Whoa, let's keep going. Secret snackies. It's not forbidden fruit, it's secret snackies. <laughs> They're not big like I thought they would be. Oh yes, I forgot to point out that they get big. Did you notice those? Another important fruit, the season is pretty much over. Although there's different types of figs. Some of them are late figs. Okay? Which one's the fig? And there's a massive big one up here, but we're not going to go in that direction. Oh. Okay, here we go. Also, you may have noticed the pomegranates earlier. There's another pomegranate here. Notice it's a lighter leaf, lighter fruit. Different types of pomegranates, different types of grapes, different types of fig, etc. I've had the other pomegranates. I need to try one of these. <sighs> snacky. Yeah, snacky. rosemary bushes earlier there's another rosemary bush here although there's another bush growing in with it which is the bush I want to talk about ignore the okay but the rest of them are one type okay so this is called locally in Arabic Satar this is a cousin of Pine and Regino which is what we call those things today um it, it smell and it leaves remind of time in the Okay. This is kind of its flowery phase, it's a dry seed flowery phase. Okay. But in the spring, its leaves are much, much bigger, they're, they're greener, they're harvested, they're dried and chopped up, and they're the main ingredient in a spice mix by the same name, za'atar. There's usually white sesame seeds, a couple other things. It's very delicious, it's good for you, it's a, a little bit uh, sour, a little bit of savory usually. Um, it's often mixed with olive oil and spread on fresh flatbread. It's one of the local favorite breakfast foods. It's fresh, hot out of the oven. Uh, we even sell baggies of it in the uh, in the gift shop if you want to take some home and try it. Uh, sometimes uh, you can use it with olive oil. There's a package with olive oil. Can you point out what the oh, pig Sorry, the reason, one of the reasons we're talking about this is some people think this is the biblical hyssop. Okay, remember hyssop, the first instance is to put the blood on the, of the lamb on the doors, right, in Egypt. 
so that the 10th plague, right, the strike in the firstborn will pass over their houses, right? So it might be the good place. Yes, there was a question. Which one? There was a baby one right there, and there's a massive adult right over there. Right there. Oh, that's that big the one with the huge leaves, right? Huge ah. leaves are big. Right, they sowed the, the leaves of the fig because they were large leaves. They're easy to sow, relatively, if you're making a garment from them. Yeah, very seasonal. They don't last long. <laughs> <laughs> they, they used what was available. Yeah. There was no animal skins. Yeah. Okay, no, 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 don't wander over there alone. Okay, <laughs> let's come on into our first building. All right, this way, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now entering our olive press. Olive press in ancient Hebrew is also two words, gat and shemanim. Gat is a press, shemanim is oils, plural. Gat, shemanim. Everybody please say gat, shemanim. Gat, shemanim. Gat, shemanim. Gat, shemanim. Gat, shemanim. Get semi. Gethsemane mean, comes from Gethsemane, it means all of them. Gethsemane, remember, the garden. Let me remind you in case you don't remember, right? Remember Jesus and his disciples are at the so-called Last Supper, which is a Passover meal. We just mentioned Passover, right? Ever since then, God commanded we celebrate the Passover, which we do. And they did in the time of Jesus, right? That's what the Last Supper is. Come on in. Let's clear the door. It's the best source of light. They sang a psalm of David, and they went out to the Mount of Olives. Remember, Mount of Olives has olive trees. There's the name, right? If you've got olive trees, you want to make olive oil. So the name of the garden was Olive Press. Clearly, there was an olive press there. Okay, it all fits together. The olives are ripe, as, uh, as Simon said, October and November. They're put, soon we'll be demonstrating this, uh, into the stone basin here. Tie a donkey to the beam, and the donkey goes, I know I'm a good donkey. <laughs> Stone is extremely heavy, completely crushes the olives in the basin, including the seeds. So it turns into a mash. They have special baskets, rope baskets, strong ones like these, and they take the crushed olives, they pack them inside the basket into the rim all the way around. Once they're filled with crushed olives and they're thick, they're put one on top of each other into a pile, maybe four or eight pallet, and they bring them over to the presses just over here. I got room for about 10 people here in the center, but no falling down the step. And you can stand at the end of the beam and look down here at the floor where the baskets are stacked. You can also see it on the other side. See the stack of baskets on the floor at the end of the beam? Over there? Yeah. Okay. So the baskets are placed on the floor under the beam, and they're covering actually a hole that's cut into the floor underneath them about a half yard deep. The hole is there to catch the oil in the water that's going to come dripping out of the baskets. It's so nice that God makes oil lighter than water. Wait a little bit, oil floats to the top, scoop the oil off the water, put it in the container, there's your precious final product. They would do three pressings, adding more and more pressure to get more and more oil from the same baskets. And so we've got the big wood beam that acts like a big old arm that goes up and down only in one direction, this way. You, lower, you put the baskets down around here, lower the beam to squeeze. Then you can lift up the three stone weights onto the beam, or about half a ton apiece with the rope and the winches, to add more and more pressure. You get more oil, but the quality starts to go down. So, first press oil is the best oil. This is virgin olive oil. This, we think, was being treated as a kind of first fruits of the oil, and therefore it's holy and, for example, sent to the temple in Jerusalem to light the menorah, the seven-branch candelabra in the holy place in the temple. It tells us is lit with the best of olive oil in the Bible. The second oil is for food and cooking. Medicine, remember the Good Samaritan puts oil on the wounds, and perfume, and ladies, we haven't forgotten you, cosmetics. That, well, men also in some societies. Uh, and then the third oil is the lowest quality oil, uh, but it's plenty good enough to light oil lamps like these. 
and also to make soap. The dried cakey stuff after three pressings is taken out of the basket. It still has a little bit of oil in it that you can't get out. So it burns well, they used it to make fires. And the basket is reused. So, back to Jesus in Gethsemane. Remember, Jesus goes apart from his disciples to pray. He's under great stress or duress, right? Uh, he is praying, Father, if it's possible for this cup to pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And he presses three times in Gethsemane. Ah, Interestingly, the baskets are pressed on the tremendous presser three times in Gethsemane as well to get out the precious olive oil. Ha! Huh, there's a cool parallel in the threes there. How about that? Here, uh... Incidentally, if we don't prune the tr the olive trees like Simon told us that we that we normally do, they can grow about twice as high, right? There's an unpruned olive tree. We strategically do this because we sometimes do filming here and we want to block out the buildings. Okay, so an unpruned olive tree, uh, unlike the rest of these trees, so it shows you how if you leave it to grow how high it can go. About two times as high, maybe two and a half times. Okay. This, uh, this is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Sarah. Sarah's picked some fresh um, uh, rosemary for the kitchen. Okay. Um, and this is actually our potter station. We normally have our potter here, but it must have been an emergency, so he had to run away. Uh, so I will stand in this place. Okay. Um, how pottery is made in the biblical period. There's actually two pools right here down the hill, one above the other. The lower one is deeper, and it's used to mix earth with water. Uh, he, with his legs, of course, stamps it and mixes it up into a mud. The mud then is transferred up to the upper pool, and the channel is blocked and it's allowed to settle. So the solids will settle over a period of maybe a day or two to the bottom. When the water is relatively clear or cloudy, open the channel, let the excess water back down. It can be reused. And the sludgy, muddy stuff is the raw materials, right? He's going to work it a bit, put it in his workshop to keep it wet and uh, not dry out. Take a ball of it and put it on his wheel. And then he's got a kick wheel. He moves it with his legs. He shapes it with his hands. And until it is in the form that he is happy with. Then he'll remove it from the wheel and set it on the shelves of his workshop. Inside there's lots of shelves in there. He's gonna let it dry for two to three weeks so it's dried completely. If he should fire it in his oven right off the, the uh, wheel, it'll shrink too fast and it'll break. Okay, so it needs to dry slowly. And then the dried pieces are loaded carefully into a careful pile inside the dome of his kiln or oven over there. There's the dome. And with a fire, very slowly raising the temperature, extremely high temperatures because the dome catches the heat. Up, slowly, down, slowly, baking, cooking the clay to its finished raw, sorry, to so its finished ceramic form, and it can be sold to its customers. Okay. Now, of course, this stuff is incre incredibly important in scripture. Just two examples from scripture that are cool and interlocked. Remember, when God formed the first human being, Adam, it says that basically God got down and dirty with his hands, right? It says he formed him or shaped him from the dust of the earth, the clay, okay? And the word for this uh, form or shape that God did is the word yatsar. Everybody please say yatsar. Yatsar. Beautiful. And the word for a potter in biblical Hebrew is yotzer. 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 Beautiful. Yatsar, yotzer. One's the verb, one's the noun, basically same meaning. Okay? So just like God formed Adam from the clay, the potter forms clay vessels. And this connection is where we get verses like this from Isaiah. It says, God, you are our father. We are the clay. And you are the potter. We are all the works of your hands. Mm -hmm. 
We're in good hands. Good hands is made. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. All right. We've got another yes question. Historical reconstructions, as they would have been in the time of Jesus, there were no archaeological parts here. The archaeological part is the vineyard. Okay. The terrace walls are found, restored, and the wine press is original. Okay. The rest are replicas based on 2,000 year old buildings using the right materials stone, earth, water, lime, etc. And uh, with the correct building styles. So, for example, the doorway, okay, uh, and lots of the doorways you see are squared stones or chiseled stone at the doorway, so you get a nice doorway for the, the door, and also it strengthens the wall. The rest of the wall is field stone or found stone connected together with an earth based mortar. Okay, natural materials, right, correct styles. It's as close as you'll come to walking in and through buildings that are like in the time of Jesus. Let's keep going right here. Five steps left into the next workshop. Please watch yourself, of course. Okay, sorry, we're going to do a reverse. My apologies. We're going to go into the big building over here. Sorry about that. A little bit of traffic here and there. We will do a slightly different order, but we will see everything. Not to fear. All right. Folks, right this way, we got a large building. There's lots of room to sit on the sides. Come on in. Oh, a synagogue. Mm -hmm. That's cool. support structure we got reeds from the size of rivers and streams and we got three layers this mud mixture okay also with straw okay light between the stones of the walls again each layer is packed down with the, the roller and dried in the sun then we got earth just a dry layer of soil and then another the mud mixture and you got to make a slope to get the rainwater to wash off the roof during the rainy season if the first layer fails the dry soil will absorb the water and hopefully prevent it from uh, from leaking. Okay? They need maintenance, but they work fairly well. Uh, but this also helps to understand another story. Remember, Jesus is teaching not in a synagogue in this case, but a house in Fadahum, Capernaum, right? And the four friends being their paralytic friend who can't walk to Jesus to have him heal him. It's so packed in the house, all the way to the door, they can't get in. And so they get on the roof and lower the man through the roof. So it's hard work. So you can dig through the earth-based materials, break the reeds, and lower the man between the beams. Now you know it's doable. By the way, we use more beams uh, for safety, so they use fewer, so there's more room. Synagogue comes from the Greek synagogue, and in Hebrew, it's Beit Knesset, and they mean pretty much the same thing. The house of gathering. 
So it's like a community center. Notice the surround seating that we found and replicated. This is ideal if you're having conversations, yeah, to see and understand each other, maybe even celebrations. Some people say it was used like a school for the children during the week. It's definitely used as a courthouse. And then, of course, on Shabbat, on Saturdays, they gather together to hear the word of God read in public and to hear teaching about what is being read. The scrolls of the Bible are kept in clay jars like these. Remember the Dead Sea Scrolls are found in jars that protected them for a very long time. And then they're stored in some kind of storage room like this and brought out when you want to read. Like in Luke chapter 4. It says Jesus came back to Nazareth where he grew up to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, which was his usual custom. In this case, he stands up to read and he's handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Jesus opens the scroll and he finds the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, opening the eyes of the blind, setting those who are oppressed free, and declaring the year of the favor of the Lord. Jesus then rolls up the scroll. He gives it back to the attendant who more than likely put it away. Jesus sits back down. Everybody's staring at him. And he begins to teach by saying, Today, these holy writings have been fulfilled in your ear. Ah, the crowd is amazed. They're saying, look at the gracious words that are coming out of his mouth. Although some of the people are asking, wait a minute, ain't that Joseph's son? Ain't the little carpenter? Don't we know him? Didn't we play football together? Okay, not quite that bad. Anyway, uh, yeah. Um, Jesus continues, and he says, Surely you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown these wonders that we heard you were doing in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is welcome in his home country. Indeed, it is true that there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah the prophet, when the skies were shut for three and a half years, and there was a terrible famine in all the land. But God does not send the prophet to any of the widows here. Or to a widow in Zarephath, in the land of Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the days of Elisha, the prophet. But none of them was healed of their leprosy except for Naaman the Syrian. When the people heard these words, they were enraged. And they drove Jesus out of the synagogue. It tells us they wanted to throw him off a cliff because their town was built on a hill. Notice how heavily answered this. Yeah. Wait a minute. At the start, they're like, hey, we really like what you say. And at the end, they're like, we're going to kill you. What happened here? Isaiah. What is the Isaiah scroll talking about here? The Spirit of God and I'm anointed. Ah, anointed is a very key word here. Mashiach, you've heard of the word Messiah. In Hebrew, that's anointed. Okay? Translated into Greek, it's Christos. The word Christ means anointed as well, right? Jesus is saying, I'm the Savior. I'm the anointed one. I've come to save you, my Jewish people. There's going to be healings. There are already been healings. There's going to be freedom. That sounds awesome. Remember, they don't rule themselves at this point. Who's ruling over them? Roman. The mighty pagan Roman Empire. Okay? They are sick and tired of foreigners. They want the Messiah to come and get rid of these darn foreigners. Okay? That's their idea of what the Messiah should do. Here comes Jesus, says, I am he, and then cherry picks these two stories of non Jewish people who God does miraculous intervention for. But it gets worse. Naaman. Does anybody remember what Naaman did for a living? Reigned in Israel. Sorry? He reigned in Israel. Yeah, he was the commander in chief of the enemy army. Just a second. What are you saying, Jesus? You're going to heal and save the Roman generals? 
We don't want you to save them. We want you to kill them. Save us. Well, Jesus is teaching this completely against their hopes and expectations. And so they probably decide he's a false messiah. And this explains their actions. They probably think that they're doing a good thing to go and throw them off a cliff. It says in the law of Moses, you put, should put to death false prophets. But Luke tells us that Jesus just passes through the angry crowd of the people he grew up with, his friends, neighbors, and relations. And he leaves Nazareth, probably for the last time. And it does face south. Hmm? It does face south to Jerusalem. Yeah. So it's built correctly. Mm -hmm. I was curious, so I pulled up a map and compass. Okay, friends, come on out. Come on out. I thought you were going to preach there for a minute. <laughs> Hear that thing? Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Go oh, call to the left, my people, to our left. Anybody need a seat? I have one nice seat right over here, if you need it. No, no. Come on in, come on in, come on in, come on in. Come on in, come on in, come on in. Come on in, come on in, come on in. I'm going to be a little bit of a little bit. I'm going to be a little bit of a little bit. But I'm going to be a little bit of a little bit. Come on in. Let's get everybody in here. All right, everybody. I want to introduce to you Joseph R. Carpenter. Hello. Yo, Joe. Okay. Uh, you can see that the tools of carpentry haven't changed much over the last 2,000 years. You got various chisels of various sizes and shapes for different jobs. Joe, what else do you use? A few stones. Black volcanic stones, right. sanding, sanding. Uh, this one. Okay. Notice that the ads, not an axe. The blade of an axe is this way, right? It's good for cutting and breaking. And adds can give you curves into the wood, okay, because of the different shape, the different uh, 90 degree shift. The plane shaves off and straightens the top of the wood. And you have the saw, the rope saw. Rope saw. My last tool. Come on. Drill. What is this, folks? The drill. drill. Very right. good. This is called the bow drill. Mm -hmm. 
we're not just showing you these tools, they're all verified by the archaeology. Okay? So we know these were the kind of tools they were using. We have a specific word in the New Testament Greek that describes the work of Joseph and of Jesus. This is the word tekton. You know the word architect? Tekton can be translated in two different ways. Worker with wood and worker with stone. So, carpenter, as we're used to, is legitimate, but they do much more than just furniture. We got beams in the roof, we got doors, we got plows. Notice the plow here in the corner with a double yoke for two animals to pull it. But also heavier iron tools were used, like these. And this is for cutting stone. There's also some more sledges over there in the corner. So we saw um, the grave, the wine press, the terraces, all these. You need heavier tools like this to cut. And also cutting and shaping stones for building houses. We think that this was part of their work. Let's give up a hand of applause to our hardworking Joe. Thank you, Joe. Okay. We're going to go through the kitchen, but no cooking is allowed. You're on vacation. We're going to take a sharp right up the stairs. Please, everyone, be very careful at the top of the stairs. Do not hit your head on the low right yeah. Watch that. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty narrow. That's going up to the next level of the house. Tell that other group still up here. There's another group up here. Okay, let me come and pick them out. She takes from the one from behind, goes to the front, gets to the front. We should get a couple of bags. She passes the shuttle. Finally, you get a, a stuff like this one. This one actually is a little bit old. That's why you can see the need for a new one. Don't look like this one. And you see the wood is getting out a little bit out of the net. And you saw how hard it was to work to prepare the wood. Little overs, you see these marks are not all away. They were also doors. They made yes. something. No, she was not both in the storage garden. <laughs> <laughs> she said, now it is you. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Hannah. Hey, there's Wait, a bird web here. Okay, we go this way. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on. Come on. All right, friends, come on up, come on in. Watch your head, watch Thank your steps. You. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, thank you. I got you. Let's fill this space for five weeks. And then they'll clear out. Keep coming through forward. Keep coming forward. Keep coming forward. Keep coming forward. Keep coming forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Watch your head. Watch your step. Good. Watch your noggin. Watch your noggin. Good. There's a couple places to sit, which you can have yourself to. There's another group ahead of us. Thank you. That's a big step. One big step is right up here. Let me get up here and help you. Thank you. Watch your head. Yeah, I've hit it before. Hello. Watch it. You're doing well. Come on up. Come on in. There's some places to see it if you want to use them. 
Thank you. Put your hand. Last couple of folks, doing great, watch your stuff. <laughs> Thank right you now. to our spotter. <laughs> okay, everybody, this is Hannah R. Weaver. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Hannah. In summer, we share the sheep, which is like that. Then we take the wool. It's not clean. We take it and wash it in bath like this. Then we take it to the comb. This is the comb and comb it like that until it's been soft and nice like this. But we want color. We dye something from the house. Skin of the onion. We dye it in water. And we have water with color. We take out the skin, and when it's not hot, we put the oil in the wool inside. And this is the color from the oil chair. This is pomegranate. Uh, Nutshells. Yes. From the pomegranate, this is color. Skins. Mm -hmm. Green, anything green, fake tree leaves. And this is the natural from the sheep. And this is for rich people <laughs> because it's from spice, expensive spice. Mm -hmm. Anyone get? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the most expensive is the purple and the blue and the scarlet. Mm -hmm. It's for king because it's from the sea snail, from the animal, from the ink of the animal. They need 5,000 drops of this animal to make dress like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, the next step is to make new string. She adds a piece of wool that she has carded or prepared. She opens, she show you before, to the end of what she was making before, like this. Look, no magic. But she makes it look so easy to do because she's got lots of experience. The string looks good, it's quite strong, but it can't be used because it tangles from the turning. So it has to be put into tightly wound balls like this and let's sit to settle for at least a month. Then it's put on the loom and built in threads, uh, vertical threads, half are hung to the front and half to the back. And she uses the shuttle to make the new horizontal rows, as she shows us now. What she's doing with her fingers is pulling the strings from the back side of the loom past the front row and the shuttle in between to, use, to make the new row. Then she's got a comb, which she uses to tighten up the new row up against the previous row. And this is how new rows are added one by one. The finished product is 100% wool, totally, utterly handmade in natural colors. We don't have fencing sewing machines, and so you tie off the ends, you snip off the excess material. Of course, they don't waste anything. The excess material is taken, and they make dollies. Ah. <laughs> Remember the wise, virtuous wife, Proverbs 31. One of the verses says that she uses a spindle and a shuttle, which means she did this work with her own two hands, even though she has men and women servants aplenty. So she works hard. Uh, thank you for our wise, virtuous thank wife, Hannah. Thank you, thanks. I miss you all. Thank, thank you. you. Where did the most expensive come from? The blue and the purple comes from sea snails. From oh, sea snails. Okay. Yes, they have to be found in their thousands. You have to know where to look and which type. And you only get a little bit of color from the body of each snail. So you have to find thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Okay? It's an incredible amount of work and how to get the color out of the snail is a closely held secret. And so this is why these colors became known as the colors of kings and of emperors. 
because they were the only ones who had enough money that they could afford to buy clothes that were made exclusively with these colors. Okay, let's continue. This way, please don't hit your head on the lower lintels. And watch your step down the <laughs> and I can remodel a house like this. And it would last. When I do the back porch, I, I think this is the style we're going for. Great <laughs> kids. <laughs> The ancient foghorn. <laughs> Tell you what, they took some time making this place. Americans going to step up their game at the at the state parks. I was about Addison's age, maybe a little bit younger. Mom and Dad took us on this big family vacation. We stopped in Illinois at uh, I think it's Illinois at uh, Abraham Lincoln's birthplace. Yeah. And dad and the uh, one of the actors got into it on where we were from. They they argued back and forth and Oklahoma and Indian territory and 